families are perfectly fine. Hi friends, good evening. I hope you're taking care of your families and they are perfectly fine and managing with all the precautions that we have to take. Relay is here with another session of you and today we have Mr. Prakash with us who has recently written his latest book which is The Spiritual CEO, Collaboration with Westland. Well, Mr. Prakash is a widely read person and brings with him a rich blend of work, business management and leadership experience. He has an experience of around three and a half decades. He is a national acclaimed author, a coach, master storyteller, a keynote speaker and an organize, organizational turnaround expert. Well, he in under his hat, he has written around 10 books. This is the 11th one, The Spiritual CEO, and has published around 1,000 plus articles under various topics of self-development, spirituality, and human behavior, and so on. The Spiritual CEO is in the new book is based on the understanding of Indian mythology, corporate lifestyles, and how it connects to the leadership and organizational shift that is happening globally in our days. Let's welcome Mr. S. Prakash today. Hello. Hello, Mr. Prakash. Welcome. Thank well, you. our fans are eagerly waiting for you to let us know about your new book and how have you been. So the stage is all yours. Yeah. Thank you, Nishita. Hello, viewers. <clears throat> If you really look at uh, the world today as it is, it's not that the world hasn't seen uh, such situations before, except that those who are part of the current uh, pandemic have no clue what happened about 100 years ago in the Spanish flu, which had more than three, four times uh, mortality rates as compared to what is happening now. And as normally would happen with human beings in less than five to 10 years, people literally forgot what had happened and uh, down went all the lessons that humanity had learned then. I was uh, pleasantly surprised during the first wave when uh, some photographs emerged which showed uh, social distancing and people with masks across the globe. And uh, it was surprising that 100 years later, or maybe a couple of years, 102 years later when it struck, it came as a bolt out of the blue, as they would say in any metaphor. And it is something that uh, humanity wasn't prepared for. But uh, nature in its benevolence uh, keeps giving, whether it's man-made or otherwise, it's a different topic altogether. But nature keeps giving so many, uh, I would say, signs, insights to tell us that there is something beyond uh, just trading and monetary gains in life. If you look at uh, the potential of what we are as a human out of three, three and a half million species that exist on the earth and plus another few million in the water bodies. We are the only one who is uh, given what is known as the sixth sense or the ability to discriminate, homo sapiens as it's called. We wake up, our ability to discriminate between what is good, what is bad, what is the cause, what is the effect, and hence, be in a position to drive our life better than just having one single uh, sustenance issue, what we call as a material life or material thinking or making money. What I have said in this book or what you are going to read in the book in terms of concept is not new, but the stories and the packaging is completely new. Normally when you read books, uh, you will find books while there are several genres that are available when it comes to specifically the two topics that are quite famous in the world. One is the self-help or management books. The other are completely books based on spirituality, which gives you a lot of insights on finding a life's purpose, finding the truth, realizing the God within, or living based on values and things like that. Unfortunately, uh, very rarely would you find that in the last 80, 90 years of book reading, which has really become quite popular in the world, very rarely you'll find something which is a, a book which balances both sides. It's almost uh, considered a taboo that uh, you can't write management while you write spirituality, or while you write spirituality, you can't write management. 
it's always considered as uh, North Pole and South Pole. But for me, when I chose to write uh, this book, which is based on uh, uh, several decades of experience in doing both sides of the coin, I have been a person with spiritual uh, uh, tilt in my personal life for more than 30 years. And as a management uh, consultant who has been practicing this art for three and a half or 38 years now, I have had a tremendous exposure to both the sides. But very rarely do you find that uh, a person comes forward and combines both to show value which uh, all along was never seen to be existing. If you look at many of the authors, they either jump full time and show how businesses can grow and make profits and keep on growing 30%, 50%, 100% growth year on year, things like that. Or on the other side, uh, they teach you how to go after the purpose. But is there a sense in... Uh, creating a marriage between both. If you look at our own human body, if your left side and right side, if you cut, you'll find that they don't exactly always match. But yet, as a human being, we strive to making both sides perfect. You can't have one arm which is measuring 14 inches on the biceps and the other one measuring 8 inches on the biceps. I'm comparing with the man. That way, you can't have a life of materialism without spiritual tinge attached or nor can you have a spiritual tinge alone without materialism. If you are able to combine both and bring out something which would make uh, not only just compelling reading but give a set of tools and uh, strategies and insights which would help people grow their business tremendously much bigger than what they were doing before. This is uh, the in my view the paradigm shift I have brought in the book. I'm not against making money, nor do I tell businesses not to make money. In fact, my entire business in my organization, what I run, is based on telling people how to improve their businesses, solve business issues, create new opportunities, go after new markets with new products and services, get the right kind of manpower and things like that. But if I have to only do that, what is likely to happen is that you will find an organization which is extremely I would say bloated uh, with only one side of what is growth. Humans, thanks to the ability to discriminate and think, are capable of doing much beyond than this, which is where the real marriage between uh, the spiritual thinking and the management thinking comes in this book, whatever term, the spiritual CEO. When the pandemic hit somewhere in the February, March of uh, last year, a few of our uh, friends, like-minded friends from the same industry were sitting and talking. And many of them know the spiritual bent of thinking I have. And they all said, Prakash, why don't you make people look within, make them look at a purpose-driven life where profit is a subset? Is it possible? And then when we were brainstorming around, uh, I did figure out that whatever I knew, if I'm able to bring them together, it was sort of uh, juxtaposing itself in a way where it created new flavors which didn't seem to exist before. And then I chose the platform of bringing uh, the long last uh, mythology, Indian mythology specifically, including stories which were unknown to many of us. When I actually dug deep to create some of these stories or refer some of the stories, I found that uh, they had profound uh, management wisdom while uh, showing people how to lead a spiritual or purpose-based life. If you really ask me a question, I mean, why a spiritual CEO? Why not a successful CEO? Why not the CEO or whatever? A CEO by default includes a person who's supposed to be successful on the material front. By nature or by their position, they are also people who are highly influential. They are people actually who can uh, influence masses in one shot. If you have, if you are actually working or if you're running a business, you don't have a choice but to have a CEO who runs the show. And by default, the person who's a CEO is capable of influencing hundreds and thousands of people. If I'm able to instill certain thinking and values in the CEO, and if it creates a ripple effect uh, through them, I thought it's much easier to reach uh, the masses where you hit one stone, you get uh, 50 fruits or 100 fruits instead of hitting one stone and getting one fruit. So when I brought them together, uh, which is not theory, it is based on the practice of what I have been doing with several organizations over a period of two, three decades. And it is also based on... Uh, the research I've done in uh, organizations, 
about organizations uh, pan india and pan world which seems to indicate that people who have a spiritual bent of mind are more successful even in their material life then the question might come then what is spirituality that is something i answered in the book uh, as well when you get your hand on the book which is published by western amazon in any of the relay stores in any of the airports you will find that spirituality is when i allow myself to express myself freely while giving the same option to somebody else to express themselves freely in this materially focused world it is something that doesn't happen many of the uh, staff or employees of large organizations whom i have coached mentored and brought them to higher levels in their career they used to say that prakash we are always treated as a commodity uh, if i don't perform for a month i'm out they hire somebody else that's why people say you know warm bodies and that is a myth which i wanted to break i have found that when you care for people and allow them to express themselves the room for them to perform better and hence getting a better roa and better turnover better profits so many of the ceos when i speak about the topic of spiritual ceo they all say prakash you are anti business i said no not at all in fact i'm pro business where i want businesses to do better than what they are doing now by shifting the focus away from profit to purpose purpose of people purpose of organization by which profit becomes incidental but it will be better than what it is before and some of the topics i have covered in this uh, book like uh, karma quotient or spiritual dna or spiritual alchemy are in my view revolutionary concepts which all along have never been spoken in any management school or in any corporate boardrooms but soon in 3 to 5 years from now you will start listening about all this in a much bigger way many of us are familiar with iq intelligence quotient we are familiar with eq emotional quotient we are even familiar with sq or spiritual quotient next to 3 to 5 years you will find kq or karma quotient thanks to the concepts i have driven in the book written in the book through which i'm driving these concepts you will find them getting mentioned across several uh, platforms uh, with that short note about the book i would uh, hand it back to the moderator to ask a few questions if it comes up thank you mr prakash it was interesting i would i would personally would want to know more about what is spiritual dna that you have written in your book and then we'll carry on with the rest of the questions that yeah, the audience is yeah sure if you really look at the concept of uh, <coughs> dna <coughs> dna is nothing but the dual strand what runs in your body which carries the information from the past and it keeps on bringing up the new versions of what you are and for the dna to benefit you uh, you would have found out that the last 40 50 years there's a lot of research which has been done the dna has to mutate into something bigger or better if the dna doesn't mutate uh, it, you still carry it's it's very simply put it is a change of habits for a positive cause when it mutates it needs to mutate in a positive way spiritual dna very simply put is when the thinking Uh, which is what is uh, making you what you are today when it is modified with a different set of values which drives your thinking the organization starts benefiting in ways it has never seen before and a spiritual dna is nothing but a set of values that you allow people to work with while pursuing the purpose of uh, making profits for the organization i am making very simple but there is an exclusive chapter in the book which speaks about spiritual dna uh, right from the time of how a organization looks at forming their uh, what we call as the why or the uh, values that is the time when you actually insert the dna and then take it forward maybe i think viewers uh, would be happy to figure it out more by reading the book exactly i i think i will also go get a hang of the book and then come back because i i am really interested in this one now so the first question that has been asked is that what is the reasoning behind choosing this title why do you feel this was the right time to proceed with this yeah as uh, uh, thanks for the question child said uh, as i was uh, mentioning uh, for me the most influential person in the world is someone who is in a position of power and authority whether it's a very small business whether it's a boutique whether it's a small panwala or even the head of the government each one of us are capable of influencing in some way every person is a ceo because 
I call that you are a CEO of U Incorporated. U is here, U. Uh, if you have to make a change to the world, you need certain tools and techniques for you to think. And that's what exactly this book is giving. Uh, if you really look at the timing as to why I chose to write, I had these concepts in my head for several years. But I found that when people go through the kind of trauma, the kind of challenges that, see, each one of us have are at least carrying a lot of scars from the last six months, one year. Some of us have, some of us have lost jobs, some of us have lost relatives. I have lost a couple of relatives, a few friends from my school time. They all went off for COVID. And this is what shakes the human belief system. What is going wrong? Why is this happening to me? Am I doing something wrong? And this is the time normally people actually uh, take a book and read to find, is there something that is happening which can be answered by such books? And this book was written with a firm hope that it carries certain answers on how not only in this pandemic, any future pandemic that might hit us, we'll be better prepared emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Emotions and the way in which you think are a subset of any spiritual aspirant. When that is altered, what happens is at least you are able to stand up and face. Uh, last six months, one year, I'm very sure there is not one person in India who wouldn't have seen death in a neighbor's home exactly. or with a family, whatever. But it makes you a better human being and makes you a compassionate human being, yet carrying on with your life, as they say, like the way water falls on lotus leaf. It has no impact, it just rubs off. Likewise, you're able to carry on with your work as uh, Gita Chari or Lord Krishna would say, in the person who's balanced under all circumstances. With that kind of a thought, in fact, I do uh, have uh, kept about three, four pages specifically for this topic, Sita Prakin or balanced mind. A person who is balanced under all circumstances. So why a CEO? Because the CEO is one who has the maximum influence. Why the timing? Timing is because specifically because of the pandemic when people are ready, they're open to listen. Well, yes, naturally, this pandemic has actually told, taught all of us that we all need to be compassionate and, you know, nurtured every day instead of thinking just about our future. That I totally agree with you. Well, the next one question is from Preeti. She says, is it wrong to have achievement orientation? I mean, a lot of us have target orientations. I mean, we are trained to, you know, uh, see what is your vision five years down the line, vision 10 years down the line, what targets you need to achieve. So I think a very well asked question that if we will not have those targets, what what should be our vision basically? Preeti, it's a very good uh, question. Absolutely no harm in having achievement orientation. In uh, one of the chapters I've written in the book, I actually share the real life story of a person whom I met, one of the executives, very successful one. Uh, he came and said uh, that uh, I don't believe in what you are saying. I had been sharing some of these concepts to him. I said, I'll give you, I don't want to share the name of the company, but I just said, okay, I'll give you an object. Uh, currently, assuming you're clearing about one lakh a month, and just a ballpark figure. Uh, I said, I'll double your salary for next month. Uh, you join my company, I'll double your salary. He, he very exactly asked, what should I do? So you have to do nothing. Every day you have to turn up for work. Absolutely nothing. Once in the morning, once in the evening, I'll just slap you in front of everyone. I asked him, would you agree? He said, no, I will not agree to this offer. I said, I'm giving you two lakhs. You have to do nothing. No, no, I have pride. I have self-esteem. How can I do that? Okay, then I asked him, fine. Uh, I'll ask you one more question then. It, it went into a series of questions which uh, is uh, shared in the book also. Then I asked him, what kind of a life do you foresee? Would you like to be a person who's going to uh, get 5x of your current position and salary and be unhealthy? Or would you like to have 2x of your salary and growth and be healthy? He thought for a moment. He said, no, I would rather prefer a 2x growth with good health. I said, fine. Why? He said, sir, what is the point in uh, deteriorating body and having a lot of cash in the bank? Doesn't make sense. I said, fine. What happened to the achievement orientation now? So now I want to grow, but I want to have a balance of uh, my self-respect. And I want to be a person who is having a good health. I said, fine, both is the granted. I'll ask you another question. Every day I go home in the evening. He was a married person. He is a married person. 
whenever you go in the evening, every day your spouse will make your life miserable. Would you agree to that? So no, no, how is it possible? I want a happy life at home. So what happened to your achievement orientation? Are you ready to give up your happiness for the sake of achievement? So no, I want to balance that also. And it went on and on and on. And finally it said, achievement orientation is also needed. I would also need peaceful life. I also need happy life. I also want at the end of the day, my family to respect me. I want the society to respect me. This is something based on uh, the famous study of Abraham Maslow that was done about 70, 75 years ago, based on the uh, hierarchy of human needs, where at the base yeah. level, you speak about uh, the need for uh, sustenance, survival needs as a call. As you grow higher and higher, it moves on to love needs, you become self-esteem needs. Then you're speaking about self-actualization needs. Uh, Self-actualization is when you live to the complete potential of what you are, whether it's about earning money or writing books or the art field or the entertainment field or in the sports line or whatever. And there, irrespective of the money that they earn, I have met several celebrities in my life. They all say that because beyond a point, for us, what paycheck we get for a movie or for a, a match or for anything else is immaterial. Though it is something that we do make it sure that we get it, but we look at the acceptance from the people for the performance we do and things like that. Human is a very complex uh, mix of achievement and several other orientations that all of us have. And if it is not satiated, what happens is sheer achievement makes you very hollow or makes you very shallow. And hence this question, uh, though it's a terrific question, as you grow higher and higher uh, at, after five, ten years of being in the same job, you will want recognition from people. You want you to be well-known in the world and things like that. And all these, in my view, are subset of a spiritually oriented person. Maybe I think that's my answer to the question. All right, great. Well, the next one is also very interesting. How to migrate karma quotient and make it work for us? Okay, how to mitigate karma question. It's it's a very interesting one. <clears throat> so if you look at karma, as I mentioned earlier about uh, intelligence quotient, spiritual quotient, or uh, emotional quotient, karma quotient is nothing but a set of inputs that you bring to the table from your past. We all know what literally karma means. If something happens today, it is because of what you have done five, ten years ago. If you're running this organization today or doing well in your relay showrooms, it's because of the knowledge and education and experience you've built over the last 5, 10, 20 years in your life. Likewise, all of us bring a sort set of positive thinking, negative thinking, negative vibration, positive vibration. See, there are times you are sitting in an airport transiting and somebody comes and sits next to you. Suddenly you feel very agitated without even your knowledge. And then you find that that person carries sort of a negative aura around him. And when you start talking to him, he pours out. He has so many issues, so many problems with his life. When the person's mind is, for example, polluted with uh, so much of negativity about himself and about life, what kind of work you think he's going to bring to the table? He's going to bring a lot of self refutism He's going to bring a lot of hatred to the table. And he's going to bring so much of negativity that he's actually not there. As they say that he has sold the soul for a price, but uh, his body is carrying it, but the soul is not there. So karma question mitigation is when you slowly let people evolve into what they are fully capable of. And everyone has a purpose, whatever the purpose may be. For some people, the purpose is just making money. For some people, the purpose could be to make some change in the world while they are alive. For some people, the purpose could be that I want to make my family very happy and peaceful or maybe make them wealthier, give sufficient studies to my son or my daughter or whatever. All these things, when you really look at it, mitigation then assumes a different proposition altogether. You look at handling the input. When I spoke about Viveka in the beginning, Viveka is about your ability to manage the cost, not the effect. Even when it comes to regular day-to-day -to -day, uh, corporate life, we all have goals. We are supposed to put in certain efforts to perform and then bring out certain results. In simple corporate parlance, the efforts that you bring to the table is called as lead indicators, which is something I've mentioned in the book. Lead indicators are the kind of efforts I have to put in. Let me give you an example. You are an athlete. 
you want to say win a gold medal in the next tournament whatever you are to playing you may have to put in 5 hours of uh, practice every day one hour of gymming one hour of sitting and uh, listening to some motivation session from your coach things like that these are the inputs that you bring to the table on which you have absolute control none of us have control on the output beyond a point if all of us had control over the output why not even one single ceo in the world of any company was able to predict the pandemic and uh, prepare the company for it i don't think any ceo knew this coming but what do we have control is the inputs that we bring to the table karma question very simply put mitigation is when you ensure that what you bring to the table is mitigated before it becomes action see so first you put in thinking that becomes action that becomes results the thinking portion of putting into a strategy framing your uh, response system all those things is what actually helps you to mitigate the karma portion all right great well this gets us to a very interesting question which preeti has asked and she says in indian mindset ready to accept karma question we are more inclined towards iq when taking business decisions in fact eq has not been adapted thoroughly what impact will ku have on the mindset i would also would want to add on it how do you think would be a leadership's mind i mean a leader's mindset to this and how would you judge a person when you actually recruit that person would you judge the him on the basis of these okay. if you look at uh... about till 300 400 years ago the world was thought to be flat till uh, galileo or uh, copernicus came and told us that the earth is round and there is a universe and there are stars what happens is that every point of time in life once a year once in two years once in three years there is somebody who comes and tells you something which i never heard before one thing that i have learned in my life uh, through several humbling situation is that just because i don't know something or just because i don't accept something does not make it inoperational just because i don't agree that uh, uh, earth is flat or earth is round doesn't make it opposite it is what it is and i need to grow into accepting to what actually it is say till 1940s hiring throughout the world happened casually in the 1940s and 1950 the concept of intelligence quotient started gaining momentum where you are assessed through a test a set of questions were asked if you scored below 70 you are called a moron between 70 to 90 you are called an idiot between 90 to 100 you are called a average person 100 to 110 you are intelligent 110 to 130 you are super intelligent above 150 you are you belong to what is a mensa club there is mensa club for iq throughout the world and that became the only yardstick to which people were measured in 80s people like daniel goldman and so many people did a lot of research along a lot of peer researchers did they found out that knowledge or technical knowledge of what to do at workplace is not sufficient to help people move up in life in leadership ladder they came out with the concept of emotional intelligence where right. not only you are able to find out who you are and how to motivate yourself you also help others to find what they are and motivate themselves we are all finally emotional human beings you like my face you will have a longer conversation i like your face we have a longer conversation because there is something in me emotionally which says i need to connect to this person and this is something which if you don't understand at workplace you treat them as machines things won't work then eq started being accepted emotional question became the second parameter on which people are listed i myself have done several assessments for several leaders you write eq test you assess the eq you assess the iq and they have an interview and then find out what they want and then in 90s based on researches by harvard and several big uh, b schools globally the concept of spiritual question came when you allow people to live for a higher purpose they didn't mix religion with this sir. they did not bring your personal faith whether you believed in christ or in allah or in shiva they doesn't matter but they did say that we all have a higher purpose higher calling if that is allowed to be practiced by you then you become a person with good sq or spiritual quotient even there they started having test to measure and spiritual quotient to great extent globally today is being measured by the amount of 
uh, mercy you are ready to display, the amount of compassion you are ready to bring to the table. Compassionate leadership today has become one of the leadership styles that are teaching these schools. When if you are not compassionate, you are going to be rude, harsh, boss. Who would work, want to work with you for long? And then these three became uh, together as the deciding factor for uh, leaders to run the organization, as well as uh, leaders to grow further and further in the career. And with the recent advent of uh, some of the research papers in the last 15 years, they found that the cause and effect, leave alone karma, you put a seed, it will germinate. If the soil is right, it will become a tree. But if you put, for example, a mango seed, it's not going to become a papaya tree. Likewise, the actions that you bring to the table, if you are conscious of it, you can't throw weed into the garden and tomorrow you don't shout at your spouse why it isn't giving roses. I want roses. I said, honey, you put weeds out there. Likewise, KQ today, you can measure. I have already started working on creating those measures. Part of that I have actually shared in the book. In fact, I recently written a couple of articles on this, which is getting published soon. It is possible to measure what you bring as karma or karma quotient to the table. With that, if you allow people to go through that, you see, IQ took about 15, 20 years for global acceptance. EQ took about five years. SQ took about three to four years. KQ might take three to five years. Doesn't matter. Once it accepts after five years, when you do this interview, you will say, yeah, I remember I spoke with you five years ago. Today, everyone is speaking. Everyone is writing the book. See, when leaders normally or someone writes a new concept, uh, normally there's a old saying, contemporaries never are well understood during their lifetime. But sure. for me, it doesn't really matter. I believe that it is good. It is right. I have experienced it. I have implemented it in a very small way in several organizations. I know for sure it works. Whether it works for you, whether it works globally, whether it works across multiple organizations, time will surely tell. But I am very certain. And what I am saying is not something uh, I have invented. Uh, this is something which has been shared in all of the Puranic stories, in Mahabharat, in Ramayana. You take any other story, they speak about karma. You do good. You take the story of uh, Bhishma, who was uh, felled by Arjun. He had to stay in that uh, bed of uh, arrows for about uh, 10 days before his death. And when Lord Krishna was asked to why by Bhishma, why I'm going through this, he said 100 uh, births ago, we had thrown a serpent or something like that on a bed of thorns and you're paying the price for today. When we see that on TV, we believe. But when it happens to us, why not? So I'm just putting, see, once you put some science behind it, people start accepting. I'm only still working out how to put the science behind, where it can be measured. I am on the way, but it will be done soon where people will have more measurable tools on hand to look at it. But uh, for certain, it is that it's going to stay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure in future how would KQ fare in, but I must say it's something very interesting. And I think it's one of the favorite topics that our audiences have asked today because almost all the questions are on karma. So, yeah. Oh, that's a, there's a separate one. Uh, I mean, a different one as well. The next one is, what is the role of AQ? What is the adaptability quotient that we have? Very good. AQ is a separate quotient by itself. If you look at the story of uh, rather the one of the world's best anthropologists known called Charles Darwin, who chronicled uh, the evolution of man. In his book, he writes... The species which will survive in the future is not the most powerful. Uh, it's not the one which has the survival of the fittest syndrome, but it will be the one which is most adaptable to change. Adaptability quotient, very simply put, is any uh, person, human being's ability to adapt to change. For example, till one year back, if somebody had told you, you cannot walk out without wearing a mask, you would have laughed on their face. You would have said, come on, take a walk. It's not going to happen. When somebody told you, every time you touch somebody, you have to wash your hands. Out of hygiene in younger days, we did follow what our parents told, but later we said, come on, give it a break. But now, all that has now become part of our life. We have adapted. But the faster you adapt, the people who are more hygienic in their health habits, the more hygienic in their contact habits, social distancing habits, and things like that, they are the ones who actually survived. I mean, many of us who must have had a bout of flu, we are almost mentally were on the verge of collapsing, thinking we have got COVID. But some of us knew that we were able to fight because our body was able to adapt. 
if you look at some of the uh, uh, the longest serving uh, i mean longest living creature in the world one of them is cockroach for its sheer size you can take a bat and swat it in less than 1 second it will die but cockroach has lived for 10 billion years in this earth compared to humans who has just lived for 300000 years who is more adaptable in fact scientists are now doing research to find how cockroaches are able to manage nuclear radiation they don't die whereas we die in instantly they are researching on elephants because elephants are found to be the only animal which doesn't get cancer so they are studying elephants to find what dna mutation it goes through which can be taken through stem cell can be transferred to humans why humans want to become more adaptable that is there and that is our basic nature otherwise in less than 100000 years we wouldn't have become the number one species in the world it took 10 million years for the dinosaurs to reach that level in less than 100000 years we now can say that we can rule anything in the world we have the power everything adaptability question simply put is something which allows an organization or a people to adapt to different situations proactively in stop something coming and thrusting the change on you i hope that answers the question so yes the next question is oh again what is karma and how can one enhance the ability to understand karma so i think what is karma has been talked about so i would just yeah. say how can you enhance the ability to understand it i give a very simple solution though difficult to practice <clears throat> see everything that happens to us one minute from now one year from now 10 years from now is based on what i do today assuming you are in the <clears throat> in a road which is a yoke there is a road on the left there is a road on the right which road do you take that depends on the decision that you make at that point of time people who are impulsive have lesser ability to understand karma people who use their uh, ability to discriminate very simply put learn to pause when something you have to decide even as simple as putting one additional spoon of sugar in your tea just pause pause for a second every spoon of sugar we know that adds 60 calories if i keep adding one spoon every time i have a tea and in corporate life you have five six cups of tea or coffee a day in less than 2 years you're going to become diabetic and after 2 years if you blame the world saying that the world made me to become diabetic who is at fault when there was a choice in front of you you did not pause to think am i going to compromise based on the taste or am i going to compromise based on what is good for me the choice is always made by us the ability to understand karma comes from the ability to pause think and then act pta pause think act very very rightly put but i am not very sure how many of us specifically our generation is going to pause and think about it but yes we all should well joel has asked a question i am not very sure exactly joel what do you want but i would give it a go to mr prakash if he can understand so he says dear sir once explain about karma and how can we explain the customers so we need the answer for yourself i think what you're trying to say is joel that how do you need to explain your customers what karma is i'm not very sure on this yeah, maybe i don't know but what i take is that can we understand the karma of the customers uh, or how do you respond to people based on their karma i mean don't bother as i said we all have this basic instinct I have done this several times while waiting for flights in the airport, or waiting in the station for the train to leave, or when people walk into the seat where I am sitting. You just take a pause and observe. Everyone radiates something. Some people radiate faith. Some people radiate belief. Some people radiate hatred. Some people radiate joy. Some people radiate happiness. You just pause. You will know what kind of a person this person is. There are only about seven, eight major emotions everybody brings to the core. You are a happy person. You are a joyous person. You are a sad person. You are a doubtful person. And based on that, if you deal with any customer, it makes it very easy. For example, if you are a salesman in a counter, a person is very joyous, boisterous. He comes to you, be joyful to him. He will like it because he resonates with you. A person is very sad. Just listen. They like someone to listen to them. If the person is doubtful. take his questions and skepticism you know answer his questions 
in a way in which he will understand. Sir, I understand you have some questions. Can I answer? Makes it very easy and makes it very uh, playful for us because I get to learn a lot when you talk to people. And that's something yes. I can never get tired of throughout my life. I, I think I would say have some patience as well to understand what the person wants. Well, what is the inspiration to write this book? What is your inspiration to write this book? So I remember long ago, I when this happened like 34, 35 years ago, when I was comparing a program in All India Radio then. I was a school student or whatever. And then I was asked to present about Alfred Nobel, the person who it was a Nobel Prize week or something like that. They asked me to do. It was a youth program. And then I went to the dosage there no internet, no nothing. So I had to go to the library to sit and read. You had to go there, take notes. It's very tedious. But these days you can just Google and find everything. I went there. I took four or five books on Alfred Nobel, started reading. I found something very interesting. Uh, this version that many of us will know, or almost all of us will know that Alfred Nobel is a a great philanthropist, he gives money and things like that. Actually, there's an another side which many of us may not know. He is the person who invented gunpowder, literally. And he is the person who made amassed millions and millions of uh, dollars during his heyday by selling gunpowder, which caused destruction. It so happened that during his lifetime, by mistake, a message went to one of the leading uh, uh, magazines, uh, dailies of the local uh, city, that he is dead. And then they wrote an obituary column for him. And they wrote all kind of curse words. It's good that this person died, something like that. And Alfred Nobel, while sipping his morning coffee or tea, read this paper and he was shocked. He got angry first and then he called the reporter. He said, why have you written this about me? He said, sir, I wrote the truth. I'm sorry that I didn't know you were dead. I felt that you have caused destruction. What have you done? You have made money, but so what? Everything that you earn money, there are for 5, 10, 20, 30 lives which have been killed somewhere. And that day was a transformation in his life. He then devoted the entire rest of his life. It said that he gave up his uh, gunpowder and uh, those kind of businesses. And then he devoted his life and created the Noble Foundation. And to create peace, to create uh, forward-looking ideas, he started giving money. When I read this and presented this paper, something struck in me as I would have been 15, 16 years old then. Something stuck in me that uh, before I leave, I have to give some expression to that hyphen between the year of my birth and the year of my death. That hyphen is what expresses what we are. And that legacy is what I wanted to leave. That's why I actually started writing books. I also make money. I also consult organization. I have a decent material life. But the world will not know me for that. How many millionaires do you know who have died 100 years back? You won't know. But you remember Mahatma Gandhi. You'll remember an Einstein, you'll remember a Swami Vivekananda. Why? Because they left a legacy. I wanted to leave a legacy with whatever I'm capable of. Little bit big, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years later after I'm gone, people will still say. That's one of the reasons I go into YouTube and publish uh, hundreds and hundreds of self-development videos. I speak about leadership. All that is something I make it available free. My purpose behind this book is to leave a lasting legacy. And this topic, which is very close to my heart, uh, fortunately, thanks to Westland, was given expression. And thanks to Relay, now is being made available to people as well. Well, yes, we do have our have the book at our stores. You can pick it up whenever you are traveling. Well, let me go back to the next question. And it says, can you expand on spiritual alchemy, What, which you talk about in your book? Yeah, Anurj, uh, spiritual alchemy, very simply, uh, if you have read the book by Paul Coelho, which came 25 years ago, called The Alchemist, it's a uh, return from the times of Jesus Christ and how a person goes in search of the eternal chemical compound which can convert a lower level metal to a higher level metal, in this case, uh, like a scrap uh, metal to gold. And alchemy is a process by which a person or a metal of a lower status is transformed into a higher status. The case of a butterfly, it starts as an egg, comes out as a larva, it becomes a caterpillar and then flies out as a beautiful butterfly, where it has transformed and metamorphosized into something bigger. Spiritual alchemy or alchemy is when you allow a person to flourish to their full capacity. 
I don't know how many of you are aware, Albert Einstein, considered to be the greatest scientist of the last century, it is said that uh, his ability was uh, measured in some way. And they found out that during his lifetime, he had only given 7% expression to his complete abilities. Imagine what all he would have found out if he had given the rest 93%. Uh, alchemy is when you allow people to flourish to the highest level possible by creating the space, creating the environment, creating that catalyst act inside of them, which will make them to grow bigger, better, and more purpose driven. And uh, spiritual alchemy is when you find a balance between your material life and spiritual life. You become richer, but not at the cost of creating a few people to die mentally. You become a responsible wealthy person instead of an arrogant wealthy person. All right. Well, this we come to our last question, which has been asked by Anjali. And she says that the concept of SQ, spiritual question, have any relevance to CEOs today? Well, a very valid one. I did answer this uh, in depth, Anjali, a little while ago. Spiritual question today, to very simply put, uh, today, many of the corporate CEOs, at least big companies, uh, go to places where they can meditate. They take one year break and go to Tibet. They learn Buddhist meditation or I do heartfulness meditation. They come and learn from us, things like that. Why? They want to become more tolerant. They want to become more compassionate. They want to become more merciful. As a woman, you would understand, Anjali, that uh, Given a choice at home between father and mother, invariably who would we pick? It is the mother. Because she is a symbol of love, she is a symbol of protection, she is a symbol of compassion. At least till 20 years ago, women were not earning as much as, or they didn't even have a job as they do these days. Uh, the, there was a very tight compartment. The man goes and earns, the woman takes care of it. I mean, those days the only option was, what are you? I'm a homemaker. But still, the child, in spite of knowing that the father is the one who is providing the money, it still goes to the mother, even after growing up. It's mainly because of the ability of the mother to give unconditional compassion, love, understanding. Spiritual, spiritual question, people know how to listen better. They are very empathetic. And today, CEOs have uh, no other choice, because otherwise you lose your talent. Today's current generation with whom I deal a lot, I do train, coach, a lot of people in 20 to 25 age. They all very clearly say, Sir, Prakash, whatever they call me. They say, we will not work under someone who doesn't listen to us. We will not work under someone who doesn't respect us. We will not work under someone whom we can't trust. All these can only come if you have spiritual quotient in built with you. I hope I have answered your question. All right. Well, we come to the end of the session for the day. Thank you so much, Mr. Prakash, for joining Thanks us. Yeah, I mean, this, this was a very nice in-depth conversation that we have. And we wish you all the best for near future and specifically with this book, The Spiritual See You. And I hope that in near future, we see SQ, KQ. While we are working, we also implement it in our lives. Yeah, I should thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Relay, and thanks, uh, Westland, for this. I'm very sure that everything that once was a seed is a tree today. Every thought was which was once considered to be not acceptable is now sort of passe, as they say. These things, someday we'll maybe sit in an airport, talk over a cup of coffee and find that they are really effective then. Till then, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Thank you.